Okay. Asha, is it playing? Yeah, do you see it? It's just paused. Oh no, okay. Let me, okay. Let me try again. It wouldn't be a Zoom session without technical issues, you guys. <laughs> This is just one of many to come. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. We can we can start from there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is going to be a lot of information and a little time. So we would first like to ask everybody to bear with us. But also, uh, if you have any questions during the talk, please put them in the group chat uh, because we would like to address them later. Uh, first of all, the session is going to be um, divided into the introduction, which I'm doing right now. Then we're going to focus on Asha's practice individually for five minutes, then Roda for five minutes, then myself for five minutes. And then after that, we're going to talk about the Abu Dhabi art uh, project called Neither Visible Nor Concealed. And after that, we're going to give you a little introduction about a project called Farasha Gallery. Uh, hence, uh, why you see a lot of butterflies uh, in the presentation. Um, just a quick background. I think um, Sarah covered very, very well and very eloquently exactly uh, how we've known each other or how we've met. But uh, Asha, Roda, and I have gone to the same university. Uh, we've known each other for quite a while now, uh, close to six years between me and Asha and four years between me and Roda and Asha. Uh, and uh, this picture was not taken during Corona time. This picture was taken in 2016 in a cheese factory in Italy, which is when we really became friends. <laughs> and uh, because of the odd circumstance, I think you can understand how this friendship works, but also how this artistic collaboration works. And also before anyone asks uh, Rova and I this question one more time, uh, we are not sisters. One of us is a real thing and the other person is a simulation and it's up to you to decide who's who and what's what. And we are not going to clarify the relationship uh, between us because everybody's asking, you have the same family name, are you sisters, are you cousins? I'm not going to answer this question. Uh, one of us uh, is Roda and one of us is Sheikha and it doesn't really matter. We're just fusing as days go by and we will become one entity very soon. Um, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, but yeah, we can move on to Asha's part. On to you, Queen Asha. Cool. Um, <laughs> so just making sure, do you see a video of like a C? Yes. Cool. Um, so I wanted to start by saying, um, just to introduce my name, like in terms of um, who Asha and then who Hava and then who Bark is because like my family name and like the way I hold my name is basically tells the whole story. Um, so um, yeah, like I'll take you through like uh, certain backgrounds of my family history and the way like um, my grandfather has like the biggest influence on me and like my father as well. Um, and just to say that um, I like using this phrase uh, recently, but just to say that Ana bint Bahab. And um, I always learned, like, my dad, Allah Yerhamma, yani, forever taking us to the sea, you know, like, on weekend trips to sleep under the moon, at, like, you know, and fish and dive at, like, 3 a.m. in the morning. So it was always part of who I am and my growing up. Um, and this is how, like, it's then related to my work. Um, so I'll just skip through this um, video. But, like, just to introduce my grandfather, who's, like, um, an important figure in my life, um, Yaddi Mbarak bin Hadar Allah Yerhama, used to be a ruler representative on Das Island, and he sat on on that chair for 30 years. Um, and the way I look at his um, like his like his work or his legacy and how it impacted me, um, you know, like the discovery of oil back then, and then how I'm like rediscovering oil through like my work and my art and this shipwreck, um, which which has very similar functionalities of like oil uh, digging as it used to be like an offshore site. And um, yeah, so like, you know, like to sum up certain things, like I put this installation together as part of Abu Dhabi art, but like also to mention a couple of things that I, I would say I stole, but like I collected from his house. Um, you can see there's like a trophy or something that's on the chair. And that's actually like in a trophy with like the first oil barrel that was given to the people who lived on Das Island at the time. 
and there's an image next to it where like you can see like a faded uh, island with like the, the image turning into red but basically just to say like you know um like these are all of his collections and the way i wanted to reinterpret that is to create something you know out of his hair out of his legacy into something like an an installation um that i would remember but uh yeah like there's a small video here also like showing him um back in the day and like um um a news clipping um that i found from my dad's archive that i just love because it like it's written in english and it's like from the 80s i mean i'm not surprised but like um just to say like certain things that it highlights like who the personality of my grandfather and the way he used to talk and like one quote from him like i really like to rephrase is um you know, I just like he says, like, I listen to people's problem and like he, he like really understood the responsibility that he had. And I really just cherish these, you know, these things. Um, and yeah, so now I'm going to start with how everything and all of this is just interconnected. Um, so <laughs> um, like going to the sea, uh, like it used to be more often than now, but like um, I discovered or rediscovered, you know, through like my adulthood, like this shipwreck that I started to obsessively dive into. Um, originally, this like always existed in a Dabaya island. People like I'm sure you guys know a Dabaya or like some of you would. Um, so this always existed in Dabaya island. And like it was a certain, uh, I call it a shipwreck. We, like my dad, Alam Nigul and Duba, if I would keep referring to it to a Duba. And it used to like be more intact. It had a room, it had certain things. And all through my childhood, like I wanted to remember and preserve like certain memories of it until it started to deteriorate. And I wanted to like highlight some of these, like the importance of it to me. And I feel like to the neighborhood. So I, I didn't want it to just go away, you know, with the wind, like I wanted to preserve objects and like uh, try to preserve as much memory of it um, for me, but also, yeah, for, for, for everyone. So like, these are some clipping videos that I used to, that I work on water and like my findings as well. And it's just, um, I think it's amazing like what it gives me. Um, so this is one of the projects in response to that. Um, I collected, um, I collected these objects, uh, which you can see there's a stair, there's a chair and a curtain. And like every time I would go, I'd find like a, a piece that I, that I would then pick back and stitch together. Um, and yeah, like it was just the start of where everything, you know, ended up being. And yeah, so there's like a couple of documentations um, from the underwater world um, where like it was, it is my reality. And um, yeah, I like, I, I like to mention here something as well, like just to think about, you know, my grandparents and their hardship into like all of like, the, you know, the pearl diving and all of that. And like the way I want to like, uh, immerse myself within within the sea is I try to like you, you know challenge myself you know by um, holding my breath as long as possible underwater or opening my eyes and just see how much I can sustain while collecting these objects and you know trying to link this hardship that they had to go through and like the way I'm like like obviously I'm blessed with the tools that I have but like also to try to experience that um, so yeah I mean there's a lot of things that uh, started from this project there's also an aquarium that you see in the back. And this is where I started, I like to say collaborate with the shipwreck. And I started to keep uh, dresses underwater and preserve them, like, like document them for a period of three years at the time. Um, and just see these changes that happens over time. Um, but yeah, I think the next video was, yeah. I'll just skip through that. <laughs> um, so yeah, like just to really, like, I think like it's, I'm obsessed with this experiment. Like I still have this aquarium in my house and like I go back to it and add the chemicals every day to see like what's gonna happen. But the idea here is to, you know, see what happens underwater equally in an aquarium where like an artificial water equipped with like chemicals and just try to like study the differences. And uh, like, there's a lot of differences, obviously you're gonna see through with the videos, like it's more greener in the aquarium and like more colorful underwater because, um, like the sea like helps uh you know like with the sun and everything it just helps to give these natural colors to the dresses um, i do like to comment here and say that people actually dm'd me once saying that um anti sahara to duba because they saw these dresses like kept there and i think what happened was like my theory i went recently and i couldn't find any of my dresses 
And I think like some of these guys like rip them off thinking I'm doing something, but I'm not. This is just like case studies. <laughs> um, so yeah, so these are like, you know, the magic I find underwater. And this is like my oil discovery um, of things. And just, I take these um, documentation. Um, at first it was just like, it, it stayed as documentation, but I wanted to evolve that process. And basically I started to look at these patterns and tar started to commission people to reinterpret these images. And yeah, I just wanted to highlight here that my way of working is all through WhatsApp. Um, so I send these images and ask these embroiderers to like, you know, reinterpret this. And that's just, it all exists on voice notes, no phone calls, no anything. But yeah, I think I just enjoyed this new process of me working and trying to find a way of um, preserving these, um, like these documentations into like textiles that I would feel like would live forever because this is not just temporary underwater. Um, so yeah, um, more WhatsApp. And then it just, it just like, I just wanted to highlight here, like um, part of my process is not just, you know, finding other artists as well that I can commission and like work with. And also to give them like an opportunity to find ways of like, you know, putting their work into mind, but also having their work, in, you know, like back and forth. And like, this is actually, uh, I worked with Al Ghadir here. Like it's, Al Ghadir is an initiative of all women who um, do these crafts and, I just basically came with like went to them and asked them to just reinterpret this photo and this is what they come, came up with and I just felt like it's very intricate and it's very detailed and it's very exact to to the way I envision things and and yeah like more WhatsApp calls this is more related to my process um, of um, my work recently and the way I like not only incorporate you know these images but also try to find um, I mean, these antique chairs um, that um, like, I have like a certain antique dealer uh, in Egypt that I contact, but I think this is more relevant to the project that I'll be talking about now. So I'm just gonna skip through this. <laughs> but yeah, like here, this is another project that was um, the result of all these commissions and all these, um, uh, you know, embroiders. And you can see here Camilla Singh, who I'm gonna invite later to talk about our collaboration in Abu Dhabi Art. But like, just to see how, like, you know, having these pieces done into from different parts of the world and then unite into this one installation. And this work was part of UAE Unlimited, um, part of Tashwish exhibition. And it was just like the first time I started to find like a new way or a new process for me to work, to find like these embroiders and, and artists and commission them and try to, you know, put this together. Um, but yeah, and this is where like the, the, the chairs start to come in into my work. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say here, like um, from that project, um, I wanted to bring in like the, the chair of my father, Allah who like, who he left it like as it was. And I wanted to highlight, you know, everything that the, like from his stains and like um, the way like the chair is indented and like all of that and try to preserve it and have it like in conversation with um, my grand, my grandmother's chair, which which you can see in front, in the front of it, and then um, just yeah, creating like a certain dialogue um, that is now I would say like fil um, inshallah. Um, but yeah, I think I'll just end here because I think that's it, and we can go into roba because uh, then it's all related to Abu Dhabi art. So I'll just stop my share. Hello everyone. So let me share my screen. Is it sharing? Yeah. Okay. Oops. So every uh, artwork starts with an, an, uh, with an adventure in my practice. I have been fascinated by abandoned places as a means to understand time, uh, time, history, and uh, place. So I began exploring these spaces, and it all started when someone was watching. Um, the thrill of being in the space as if someone is watching. So 
um, I began investigating the space and collecting uh, found memories as I see valuable. Um, it all became like an archaeological experience for me. So I started questioning the space and the presence of who lived there, where, where did they go, and why did they leave their personal belongings. Um, it was only when I found the passport. So the passport, um, like it was a significant piece for me, like one of the most important findings as the president spoke to me to, that wanted to send a message. Um, so the passport that I found, it, uh, the date inside the passport matches my exact birthday which is 27th, 27th of August. And so it was like really scary for me that like one of the findings was like, like it, it was matching. It was, it, it was like really scary. So, um, and a lot of the, uh, the findings that I found are like um, passport size photos. And I have a collection of 368 passport size photos which I found like everywhere. I then moved to Mina where my old studio warehouse was and Mina became a home to me because like it's the only route that I know, I know, I know going without using Google Maps. Uh, I started exploring the neighborhood as I came across burnt demolished warehouses that drew my interest. Uh, by the way, the structures were collapsing. So, oops. Yeah. Oh, I did it start. Okay. By the structure that was collapsing. So the thrill within these collapsing, um, these collapsing warehouses wasn't by like being stopped by the police twice, but by the signs outside that says like deep excavations or like um, no entry. And so like building structures and concrete metal rods were inspiration to my sculptural works. And these are photos of like different places I visited. And this is one of my early works, uh, which is called Found Abandoned Memories. It's about tracing physical movements and the disappearance of the presence. So the process of this work was interesting because it was like, uh, I was interested in like speeding up the process of time by aging. And so you can see here in the video where I, um, I'm using a technique of uh, paint stripping the outer piece of the uh, truck. And I discovered after four years of doing this project that my family owns a truck scrapyard, which was like, like, like no one told me about. So if I would have known then, then this project would have been like much more interesting with like hundreds of truck cabins. So this is like some uh, shots of like, the truck scrapyard that they have. Um, let's skip through this. So these are some trucks. And uh, this is another project I worked on for Salama bin Hamdan Foundation. Um, it was a technique of like rusting copper patina and the process of speeding up the uh, speeding up the process of um, rusting. So I started experimenting with aging as a, uh, as a technique of rusting the copper instantly using chemicals and uh, like the sound of the scissors, which was, uh, which oxidized the copper instantly, uh, which gave it like a greenish blue patina color coating. It was a form of mark making on metal for me. And um, like I figured out an, uh, a formula to control the depth of the rust vibrancies, which was interesting. So this project was mostly like on experimenting the technique of uh, rusting on, on metal. And you can see here like the different details of the color blues. And this is another project I work on, which is um, welcoming. It's a concrete on carpet. The idea of concealing and revealing uh, details of uh, complex patterns by the use of poetry, as I reversed the idea of like concrete is usually placed on the floor. Uh, uh, carpets are usually placed on the floor on top of concrete, but here it's like reversed 
where concrete is on top of carpet, but then it's placed on the wall. And yeah, so an advice for me from me is like, don't mix concrete with your hands. <laughs> and that's about it. Uh, Sheikha, the mic is with you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rada. By the way, uh, everyone on this call, I just have to clarify, Rada doesn't do talks. So this is like a rare occasion. You have just witnessed some form of something that's probably not going to get repeated for a while. So uh, you should all be feeling lucky. Um, wait. OK. I cannot start screen sharing. Just a minute. Mm, I closed mine. Okay. You guys can see my screen, correct? Yeah, we can see it. Yay, okay. I'm so sad because like, if I'm talking, I can't go on the chat. And I feel like the chat is a more fun place to be at the moment. Um, but anyways, I thought a lot about how I'm going to introduce my practice with, within the limits of five minutes. Uh, but I will just go through a very simple uh, surface exploration of the practice. Uh, first of all, uh, this is something I see on a weekly basis because I am from Al Ain and I go to Al Ain every week, but sadly, because of this uh, whole uh, border closing thing, I am very sad and I'm very far away from my hometown and it's not the best ideal situation. But uh, let me tell you a little bit about what I do in Al Ain and how that influences my practice. So, the background that you see right now is actually uh, in a park in Al Ain. Al Ain is a city 138 kilometers away from Abu Dhabi, full of luscious greenery, but also a desert city, uh, full of these oases and pellet systems. Of course, you're all very familiar with Al Ain, but I will still take you on a tour. Also, I see my friends every week, which are ostriches, because our family owns an ostrich farm. I know it's kind of a weird investment, but that's who we are. Um, and next is me in front of a fort next to my house in Al Ain. I spend my time in Al Ain also going to fabric shops and tailors, which is wonderland for me. Like, it's the best activity, de-stressing activity that I can think of. I really miss this, by the way. Uh, I'm doing it virtually at the moment. Um, and I do, you know, get my henna done. Uh, everything happens in Al Ain. Uh, also, I do a lot of work in the desert. I build these structures and I do uh, performances and rituals on them. And so Al Ain has sort of become this geographical area where my artwork is spread out. I collect satellite dishes. I put them in this little house thing <laughs> that's in the middle of the desert called Elizabeth. Um, and so, of course, all of these places I really miss. I create artwork there. Uh, I also have friends there. They visit me while I'm making the artwork. And so, yeah, but that's not all there is to Al Ain. Uh, Al Ain is a world of wonders. I've uh, grown up in it, and every corner is filled with something strange that shouldn't, something misplaced, something that shouldn't be there. You take a walk in the neighborhood, you find a microwave on the side of the road for some reason. There are just weird things everywhere. And for me, this is magical. Uh, like, I don't need to go far away for any dose of inspiration. I just really need to go to Nain. Um, of course, this, listen to me against the backdrop of how much I miss Al Ain right now. I haven't been for a while, so <laughs> my passion is coming through, uh, I feel. I'm too excited. Uh, but basically, this is scenes from my grandparents' house. Uh, again, uh, just a second. Yeah. Back to the carousel which is also uh, right next to my house in Al Ain. It's a five minute drive. And it's a carousel that's very Emirati themed, as you can see. There is a, there is a painting of a, of a like Della on the actual carousel. Um, but anyways, the thing about Al Ain that's very magical is it has one of the oldest archeological sites in the UAE. Uh, they date back to 3000 BC. Uh, before common era, not before Corona. <laughs> uh, but uh, everything is in close proximity to each other. So you have the desert on one side, you have the oasis, you have my family's houses, uh, and then you have the ostrich farm. And then you also have um, 
the Healy Archaeological Park, which is a park in Al-Ain that has these uh, archaeological sites and tombs. And then like five minutes away from it, there's Healy Fun City, which is one of the oldest amusement parks in the UAE. And it looks exactly like it used to look. I mean, a lot of it is stripped down now. They basically sold their roller coasters. I don't know how they have the authority to sell a roller coaster, but uh, they gave it away at some point. I was very sad about that. But all of these things are close to each other in terms of uh, the drive between them. And I'm interested in that a lot because all of these things contrast with each other so much. And it makes me think that anything that's ordinary in Al Ain isn't really ordinary. It's, uh, it's always like, it's always a bit, it has an edge to it. It has some, some form of magic that I try to capture through my artwork, whether through drawing, through photographing these spaces, uh, through creating performances around these spaces, through creating rituals, through visiting these places. So it's always me migrating between these different locations. So now that I have uh, illustrated my life in Elaine, <laughs> I also want to allude to a whole other part of uh, my practice that while I was making this presentation, I was thinking maybe it's worth shedding a light on which is something that we've all grown up with uh, since we were children, which is anime and Arabic dubbed anime. And, you know, for me, this is still super, super important, you know, and like the way that I grew up with the, seeing these things, like a, a heightened version of fantasy, not even reality. And all of these heroes, you know, for example, Yani Lady Oscar, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with this anime but basically it's like a family heirloom my mother watched it i watched it it was it was around for a generation now but it's uh, highly i highly recommend watching the series from start to finish it's magical um even even if you're not a child actually if you're a child you shouldn't be watching the series uh but um, but just this heroism this this idea of having a protagonist uh this idea of all of these, it's just, you know, anime is a magical world. Uh, contrary to popular belief that it's for children, it's actually, يعني, the, the people who create this stuff, يعني, load it with their own hopes and their own dreams and their own desires, and it becomes its own beast, it becomes its own thing. Um, so, يعني, I enjoy that a lot. So, you know, putting together that backdrop of like growing up between Babi and Ain, and also fusing it with this, you know, newfound appreciation for works of art such as anime. Uh, I, I've, I started to think, and يعني, this is, these are the two biggest influences on my practice. And so I was digesting the world around me through painting uh, these different scenes, مثلا, in Al Ain, uh, through creating a protagonist that's almost always يعني, not present. Uh, within this painting, for example, uh, or decapitated <laughs> or has missing parts. And I was just interested, I think, in the idea of the protagonist. Of course, completely not consciously interested, but in the back of my head, I always was pursuing this, يعني, this idea of like inserting myself within my work. And so I started doing these performances all around Al Ain, going to different places in Al Ain, creating structures in Al Ain, um, performing around these structures and uh, carrying out these rituals or uh, these reactions to these places. But every time I watch these videos, I feel like that's not me, even though I did the performance. Like I, there's a disconnect between myself and watching myself being the hero or being the protagonist or being the leader of that story or that world. So, I always find that very interesting. I mean, at this point in time, that's what I really wanted to focus on when talking about my work today. It's just this, uh, these new ideas that I was thinking about instead of actually going uh, through different types of works. But um, yeah, just uh, showing more videos from my, uh, from my explorations in different parts of Elaine, legally and illegally. Um, I hope. <laughs> okay. So yeah, and then I started maybe exploring just a little bit of actually trying to clash the two words, worlds once more and uh, inserting myself within the narrative, but with making people participate within my work. So this was an art, uh, like it was a performance that I did in Art Jamil, 
uh, last year uh, as part of the youth assembly in which I was uh, doing a ritual or maybe rather not me because I can't identify with this person I'm looking at uh, where I'm drawing uh, people's fortunes uh, basically or uh, seemingly looking into their fortunes and uh, getting uh, drawings out of that as a reactionary way. Um, but yeah, basically, again, this is an older work, but it, it follows the same idea of being, uh, you know, putting in a protagonist or focusing on a subject that is alive, even though it's seemingly not alive. Uh, but that's it from me. I probably took way more than five minutes. I'm so sorry. Uh, but thanks for listening. <laughs> we still have a lot to go through. <laughs> it's, uh, do, you, do you want us to pause for a second or are we okay? No, you're good if you want to go on to the collaborative work. Okay. But I just want to say thank you all. That was a great start. And it's fine if you go for five minutes. It's worth it. <laughs> okay, I hope uh, people don't have uh, anything better to do than stick around and sit with us. Thank you so much. Okay, we are going to dive right into Abu Dhabi art. Okay. I, I, yeah, that was yeah. just for me. I clap for, we clap for ourselves. We, we did a lot, okay? Uh, as some of you are familiar, okay? So I know a lot of people on this call have uh, been to the show in Abu Dhabi Art and a lot of people haven't. So we are going to take you through different parts of the show and then elaborate on those parts of the show. Uh, but I think also for the people who have attended, uh, there has been a lot of um, questions and inquiries about a lot of the things that we did there. So I will take a minute to just explain the curatorial uh, element of the show. Uh, our curators are Rakhni, Ramin, and Hassam. As many of you are familiar with their practice, uh, they are Iranian artists living in Dubai and they, are, uh, they have a highly collaborative practice. They live, breathe, and eat art. And uh, they, are, they have been our, not only our curators for this project, but our mentors and our uncles and our god uncles or whatever you want to call it and truly this project has enabled us to really come together as one team and one entity and one beast and one brain and so they are the masterminds behind this project and they wanted us to collaborate uh, we already had existing forms of strange collaborations but they have formalized the way that we collaborate and they have chosen the auditorium within um, the Manat Sadiyat where Abu Dhabi art is because they sort of wanted to break away from uh, the idea of exhibiting in a white cube space. And they wanted us to do something that's so immersive, uh, so different, um, something that's going to be more engaging than pieces on the wall, which they know that our work doesn't even fit in that. And so it was sort of a match made in heaven was very perfect for us to be uh, curated by them. Uh, but I want to uh, share an excerpt of their curatorial statement. And uh, just a second. Um, the, it says, the blackness of the auditorium is that of a perception which comes through the black pupil of the eye, which is the threshold between the internal and external vision. Choosing to exhibit at the auditorium does not intend to address the recent discourses around black box and the white cube. Black as a concept of unity, it is the amalgamation of colors on the color wheel. Plants are rooted in absolute black. Black is the place of growth. And that, you know, perfectly captures the essence of exactly why we were, you know, why, why they decided for us to exhibit there. Um, but I'll just go on for a bit longer. Uh, okay, so we wanted to show you the space right before we actually started working on it. As you can imagine, we walked into the space and we were like, how are we going to put artwork in here? We like, it's not equipped for artwork. There is no proper lighting. Uh, there is, it's, it's, not, you know, it's not a place for artwork, it's a place for screenings and talks. And so there was a lot of challenges within the space itself, but it also provided a lot of potential. By the way, do you guys see yourselves in my screen? Should I move you? No? Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, because uh, you're like in the middle of my screen. Um, anyways, so as you can see, like the 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 place was still, uh, you know, it needed a lot of work in terms of what we can exhibit within the space. 
Um, but curatorially, I just want to expand a little more. Uh, a lot of the ideas that they brought up curatorially for the project centered around presence and absence and presence within absence. And that's why it's called neither visible nor concealed. Uh, they noticed that the three of us in our practice, there is a figure, but there is no figure. There is uh, someone who's altering the work, but they're not present in the final product. It's a lot of coming in and out and interchanging these roles. And so they based their entire um, curatorial statement on this uh, Mahmoud Darwish poem, which I will take the liberty to, de to read. <laughs> uh, uh, we all should we do it together? Okay, let's do it together. <laughs> okay, Roda, Roda is face bombing. Yellow, one, two, three. أثر الفراشة لا يرى أثر الفراشة لا يزول هو جاذبية غامض يستدرج المعنى ويرحل حين يتضح السبيل هو خفة الأبدي في اليوم أشواق إلى أعلى وإشراق جميل هو شامة في الضوء تومئ حين يرشدنا إلى الكلمات كلمات باطننا الدليل هو مثل أغنية تحاول أن تقول وتكتفي بالاقتباس من الضلال ولا تقول أثر الفراشة لا يرى أثر الفراشة لا يزول um, and it's basically we translated it into neither visible nor concealed and I know the English version doesn't have any mention of a butterfly but uh, somehow because the Arabic poem has a lot of mentions of butterflies we have just adopted it as our symbol I mean, you know, the symbol of a butterfly is way more nuanced, but uh, we, we just love it now. خلاص. We will call it ourselves uh, Parashat. Uh, but uh, yeah, and so again, just to reiterate very quickly, uh, the curatorial uh, understanding about the project is this presence with an absence again. And then this idea of us being in plain sight, but invisible within our work. Um, and also, they questioned the, this interchangeable roles that we have within our societal fabric. We are all, we are both like daughters and sisters, and we are also working women, and we engage within the public sphere, and we're not reclused artists. And that idea was very interesting for the curators, uh, to be able to interchange these roles and to be able to function fully as an artist as well. Of course, it's very challenging if you ask us, but uh, it's rewarding. Uh, and then this idea that the three of us are completely connected and one, one with the land, one with the sea, one with the nature, and we're connected with the man-made as well. Roda is more of a construction and uh, urban sphere girl. Uh, and then this idea of weightlessness. Uh, in this modern world, we're all sort of connected to our phones. Our phones are an extension of us and they become a tool for us. Like the way that uh, Asha spoke about using WhatsApp to create this collaborative artwork. It's, it's, a, it's a new way of making the world work. And so we're, we, they were just interested in this idea of us all becoming one together with our technology, with each other, with um, everything. Oh my God. Wait. Okay, so now I will just go very quickly uh, through step by step. Uh, exactly how the show looked like. So I'm not going to elaborate. I'll let the girls elaborate later. Uh, but we will go just one by one through every element of the show. If you haven't been to the show, this is your chance to sort of get a walk through. Um, so this is the entry area where you see like sort of a found object connected with uh, part of the poem that I have just read and also uh, artworks connected to it. And it leads you to the auditorium from the from the art fair. And you go in and like, there is no sense of direction. Should I go upstairs where there are lighted butterflies? Should I go where the video is on the right? It's, it, it's all intentional that there is no direction. And so you go in and you look at these videos spread over 13 meter wall. And there are also chairs for you to sit down and watch the video and sort of uh, uh, engage with the artwork. And then within the corners, there are also different elements of found objects, uh, such as this airplane seat um, of course, you can guess who made this. Um, and then you go around also because, again, there is no sense of direction within the space. There is this cultural piece rusted. Uh, it gets its own moment. And then you also walk through a door. You see a painting on your right. 
and you come across also the work that Asha spoke about earlier, which is both a carpet with a found object with a, a strategically placed uh, piece on the wall. Okay, and then you think you've seen enough, but actually you just came into the show. <laughs> um, this is the this is the sort of the bulk of the show. Uh, you see a hanging sculpture. Uh, too, too many things to digest at once, which is also has been super intentional. There are videos between the chairs. Uh, there are artworks everywhere. There are details that you can't miss. You don't want to. There's like also these set of carpets, wallpaper, uh, art pieces that are basically wearable. Um, and it's a lot, but it's also all interconnected in which our works are connected to each other and they lead to the next step. You see a bathtub with a video in it. Um, you see a chair in these details. It's all in the details uh, with an oil. I don't know what this, what this is called, but I know you know what it is. Um, again, uh, there's a drawing sitting on a chair the butterfly appears again. Of course, yeah, I, I don't think we're going to be able to say this later, but the butterfly is actually from a Eid celebration uh, lighting system that was installed all over Abu Dhabi. But we got it legally, not illegally, just saying. Yeah, we paid for it. Uh, <laughs> we paid for it. <laughs> but it was on the streets. And there's this idea of bringing the city in. And you see also these sculptures, which Roda is going to elaborate on. A uh, small alley uh, corridor with uh, pedestals on it and little objects that when you look closer, they are actually handbags. This is so magical. I love it. Okay. Um, and then, of course, the chair fit for giants with a chandelier. And the flying carpet hanging over your head. And the lights, let's say, the curatorial statement. Suddenly, out of nowhere, there are performers who are performing a high uh, energy, highly emotional uh, theater show, which also Asha is going to elaborate on. And the drums by Kharsha Drums, which we collaborated with as well. And then the show goes into, into, into quiet moments and then suddenly into high energy moments with the performers cycling around the exhibition, around the artwork. And then you think you've seen enough, but it's still not enough. Uh, you go into a corner and you see this uh, broken glass sculpture uh, of TVs with lights in it and it draws you in to the corner and you think you're done and you go into another room which is the backstage room basically and it looks like it came straight out of a cult or a movie um, but uh, you see all of these little objects on the ground uh, it looks like someone has been working there there's tiny details everywhere um, you still question what's happening. And then this is the door that leads you to the exit. I want to take a moment to breathe because I have been talking for a long time. <laughs> okay. I think uh, we are going to start by digesting the show one by one. If you have any questions, please text us in the channel. I can finally chat with you guys. Rova, please take it away. Uh, to the next step. So Rada will be speaking about the hanging sculpture and all of her other artworks within the exhibition. Rada, tell me when to pause. Okay. So I'll talk about the parcher, which is the hanging ladder sculpture. So the structure came by investigating architecture and abandoned um, collapsing warehouses. The structure that uh, the structures that were being demolished. So I found myself stuck in a way where I can't like collect objects, but started creating objects that look more found. Uh, so one thing uh, that I always have in my head while going to these places is like, what if I had a ladder? So this phrase was always in my head while going to abandoned places. And the idea of like the floating carpet, which holds um, fragments of like the lost memories of the people who, who lived there are like placed within the the carpet itself and the, the idea of like time travel and departing to a non-existing space. So the ladder here is placed in my, my previous warehouse in Mina 
and you can see like the scale like this warehouse was like perfect for me because like you just can't you just can't park your car inside your studio so that was like the most amazing thing ever uh so yeah so this uh, this this ladder was like before i take it to the sea and i decided to collaborate with the sea in a way to collaborate with asha's Wadiya island so i took it to the sea terrace uh, to get the red vibrant colors um and then like that just took two days i sent them back so um this is the ladder and how it looks in the auditorium and and it was like the most complicated thing ever because like the technicalities of like reaching the top of the the rods is like it, it was like the most difficult thing ever anyways so let's people move almost, on almost fell but like i would almost say fell, like people yeah. climbing on top without any safety gears it was so hard like, maybe we should not mention hey, that yeah, yeah. <laughs> so from now on if you guys see any of the three of us in the same show please understand it's a safety hazard we're never going to be responsible if something <laughs> falls on your neck. but yeah, uh, we've been yeah. hanging with no <laughs> Anyways, and the most stressful thing ever is like the carpet reaching from India, like three <laughs> days before the show. No kidding, <laughs> but yeah, uh, it was like a, it was a customized yeah. carpet of like the fragments and memories of the people on top of it, and I wanted to exaggerate the carpet with the long tarbusha threads. Uh, and yeah, so can skip through, Sheikha. Okay. So I'll look later. Yeah. You can see how safe they were on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but... So ascending, which is um, the other sculpture next, transporting okay. objects through time in a rit ritual of mark making and the aging technique with acids and uh, chemicals. So you can see here, like how I collaborate with like blacksmith metal workers in Safah and how I get inspired with their work melting metal um, and so the next work is the carpet the circle carpet yeah so this was inspired by the passport findings and the patterns of rusting patina which came together as one whole work, uh, as you can see the details of the passport inside, like weaving into the carpet itself and exaggerated with long threads. And can I can... just add here, like also like part of our practices, we share um, suppliers and this is like where it like, <laughs> you know, happened. I'm like, did you check on this guy? Is he like making you the carpet like on time? <laughs> so yeah. But we get discounts for each other. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So the airport road signs, like after years and years of like looking for airport, uh, like airplane scraps and so on, I found a guy in Safa who gives me free gifts. And one of the gifts he gives me is like a scrap airplane seats. And that was one of the most wonderful things ever because like, he became like I go to the scrapyard and he'll be like, "Oh, what do you want? I'll give you anything." So, wasta. yeah, wasta. And when Asha goes to him, he'd be like, "Okay, what do you want? You need to pay." <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but he like, gives me free stuff. Sure and he he take permission from Roda first, so he can give me. Yeah, he calls me. He's like, Asha <laughs> wants stuff. Should I give it to her or should she pay? <laughs> oh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. And here you can see like how the drawers transform into um, the artworks of themselves as like people leave their personal belongings behind with open drawers as if they left their, like they left it intentionally. Um, and so the drawers here, uh, here hold like all the memories and photos of these people who were left behind. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. Hola. Oh, okay, one more. Uh, the glass sculptures, uh, like during uh, during visiting abandoned places, they're like one of the the indications of a place that is abandoned is like the broken glass. So it's like one of the 
one of the uh, indications of like I can enter like no one is in there like it's broken glass so um, yeah I think can we just say how dangerous this is and how yeah. we all hurt our hands by touching this okay yeah, my hands were bleeding but oh I'm sure it's fine <laughs> okay thank you Roba loves Put your good questions stuff. for Roba in the chat okay please don't <laughs> Okay, I'll just speak very briefly about the videos that I have had set up. Um, basically, again, something shared within all of our practices that we wander in uh, all of these locations and we interact with them. And this is on the way to Al Ain. So this is an abandoned uh, park, I think, from the 80s and an abandoned bowling alley on the way to Al Ain. And uh, it's sort of part of the desert. Like I consider it part of the desert because it's just so close to it and it's completely taken over by the desert in terms of like sand being everywhere and so it started becoming a place where I can use it as sort of a vehicle for the rituals that I do and so I'll just keep these videos playing as I just speak over them as you can see now my protagonist for the Abu Dhabi art um, show has been slightly edited uh, and I think now I'm sort of creating this character who interacts with their surroundings within this way. But uh, for me, the, the sort of everything happens very organically. I don't plan what I'm going to do. I don't plan where I put the camera. Of course, all of this is like a one, one woman show. Uh, so it's more about just living within that moment and experiencing that moment and just thinking about compositions as drawings but also the act that I'm doing as a drawing it, I, it's, um, it's like for example you see the person on the right drawing a circle in the like a floating circuit and all of this for me all of it is like one act it's one one thing like drawing is not different from um, No, drawing isn't different from ritual or performance. Everything is sort of spontaneous and based on sort of the emotions or the things that I'm feeling or thinking about during that time or during that day. Um, but more of just interacting with the land and, you know, for example, for this specific piece, it wasn't that I found a bathtub in the middle of the desert. It was that I had a dream that there was a bathtub in the middle of the desert. And I wanted to sort of create that interaction between acting out the dream and drawing the dream and also doing this performance in the middle of the desert. So then these three things start speaking to each other. Like the writing piece about the dream talks to the drawing. The drawing talks to the performance. The performance then creates a new drawing. And it's always like uh, the, the process always goes like that. So. If you want to watch these videos separately, I can also share Vimeo links, um, but they are pretty long. So if you have time and you want to meditate, sure. Um, anyways, next is this room that I've shown earlier. And basically uh, during Abu Dhabi art, uh, there was a ritual in this room in which people who participate in the ritual, it's a one-on-one -on -one ritual and there are no photos uh, to be taken. And it's very quiet and I would be there sort of guiding the ritual practice. Uh, the participant would be choosing different drawers. So as you can see, these uh, conical shapes are actually little drawers and they have little objects in them. And so they can, we start to do a, a, a roll, a, to roll, to roll a specific set of dice. And then I find objects that are related to these people and also then create these drawings. Again, because I'm so removed from my practice, it feels weird for me to say I did this performance. But you know, my, my alter ego did this performance, whatever you want to say. Also, if people did come to this performance and received a drawing by me in this performance, please let me know. <laughs> As you can see, Rola here is very happy with the fortune that I have told about her, about her life in this drawing on wood. Uh, <laughs> but basically, that's it from my side for Abu Dhabi Art. Uh, Asha, on to you. Ah, cool. Um, yeah, okay. So 
I had this vision for the auditorium where I wanted to collect, maybe pause here just a little bit, like collect these chairs um, that comes from like a domestic home, like our, like our majlis or something. And, and like these chairs are either been used or has been like, um, an, like an antique chair that already came in with its memories. So I wanted to bring in these like um, chairs and like have them interact in this auditorium where people are going to interact and sit on it and watch the performance. Um, so here I just want to talk quickly about, uh, I think like the way the performance uh, came to be is basically, and like what I really enjoyed about this is just, you know, the writing of the script for a performance that um, I wanted to realize and co like co-directing this with uh, Camilla um, to make all of this happen. Um, and just, you know, having this text that, that, that was written um, um, from certain traumas in life and like things and and then having like these performance also like, you know, I think just go back a little bit just because I'm like uh, trying to catch up with the video. <laughs> um, just maybe a little bit back, hey, like maybe we pause here. And yeah, just basically to highlight like, um, like what was important to me is yeah, um, the like the whole thing of like directing and sitting on a director chair and just digesting you know these performers their movements and how things are going to happen but like from the start I always wanted to create um, like a performance that is not like a stage performance but something that happens around you so the way we planned this performance with Camilla who I want to introduce um, now um, is um, to basically just you know like have the performance sit next to the audience and eventually like when like no one is knowing like you know things start to move and um so just a quick i'll just give a quick bio on camilla um camilla singh is a multidisciplinary artist and an independent curator she has over 15 years of experience working with the cultural institution theater dance companies and corporations she started grassroots initiatives and worked with visual artists musicians chefs producers and others she's currently the senior program um, programmer for Barclay Abu Dhabi, where she is about to launch uh, the When Is Now performance series. So Camilla, if you want to say like few your, few words about this. Can I play? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, sorry, Camilla, just, my audio. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Hi Camilla. Hello. Hi everybody. Um, I'll just say a few words about the process of uh, working on this piece together. Um, you know, very closely with Aisha, but really all with uh, all four of us worked together. And then I would say all seven of us, wait, I had to do the math, <laughs> the curators. Um, you know, it's, it's a really interesting aspect of this is uh, common to the way I work in, in, in a lot of different parts of my practice, which is to really think about, about how to translate an idea from one almost medium to another you know so if we're talking about a story and then we're thinking about movement in space and then within an installation that you know we all have to understand that we're writing a piece to occur in a setting that won't exist until the moment we start and that every time we inhabit the space as performers um, we tell the story in a new way because we, we approached it in this um, in this way that was that had set sort of key um, elements to hit, but we allowed the audience to occupy the space as well in any way they chose, and we didn't restrict anything really um, that I can think of. You know, uh, so if there was something that we planned as a movement or an action or a part of this piece with the performers, you know, to happen on a particular chair and someone chose to sit there, we'd have to adapt. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I really love that it, in a sense, to me, reflects the, the very essence of our being in, in, in the sense that it, in, in viewing this, piece and making this piece and performing this piece you know a few nights in a row nothing is ever the same and you can never take it in from a singular viewpoint you know and, and I and I say that reflects the essence of who we are in the sense that we are always changing you know there's never there's never a, a singular way to see something 
or do something or interact with something, it just, it just throws you for a loop if you try to do it twice, you know? And I, I think that for me, the, the way we approached every aspect of directing this piece reflected, you know, what it was about. Um, and, and that's in a way like getting to the idea of like, what was the essence for me, like in, in, in talking with all three artists, um, but really intensely, you know, with Aisha over time, over a long period of time, you know, uh, throughout different works, even, you know, like we've collaborated in different ways. And I think they, they, they culminate. Um, but I, I, I've also known uh, Rode and Sheikha's uh, practices, you know, so there's, there's, there's something that is really important about it that it, that also comes together um uh, not just spontaneously but in terms of i knew zane would have to pipe up right <laughs> word in. but let's yeah maybe we can play the video actually just to get yeah. some <laughs> okay all right right after i'm going to watch the i'm going to watch uh, Sorry, my son wants to watch Scary Ninjas right now. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm alone with him. <laughs> Should I keep talking? I, do, I mean, I think there's really just yes. one more thing I wanted to say is, is you know, that it's um, the, the, the performers become a very big part, of course, of how, how anything can happen. And we had a sort of shift in who the people would be at different times, you know. So with the, every single communication about what a person should do they're not they're not professional dancers they're not professional actors you know they're student actors and so there's always this way that you have to talk to someone about what how to literally inhabit an idea in their body and i think this is a perfect moment in the video like you know it's something that comes from inside and it comes from external and they have to deal with the weight of things the heat of things, you know, and, and, and all of that visceral experience is very much a part of what the whole performance was. Sorry, I, I don't know if you can hear this is insane for we me. Can hear you. I'll turn my audio off now. <laughs> no problem. Thank you so much, Linda. Hi, Zane. What, uh, do you want I did to want to mention one part, actually, from this performance, just because, like, I think it was one for me um you know to see an action if we want to like she yeah. we go back to that like, uh, yeah and is there a sound maybe just a little yeah. bit okay, okay yeah maybe yeah <laughs> it sounds more aggressive this way but like it wasn't um <laughs> But I just want to like pause where like the image as well with the, you know, with the sketch. Um, just to say like this scene came from um, a child, like a childhood memory with my brother where he basically wanted, he was so angry at me and he wanted to humiliate me and like um, printed this picture of me in green and cut them out so perfectly and went on his bike and like threw these images around in the neighborhood. And like just to talk about that moment that where like I, for like months I shied out of like leaving the house and like talking to people who like saw like my image, you know, my picture on the street. And it was just very traumatizing that I wanted to just have fun with it and try to re reenact it in a way where it's like, it's not as, you know, um, so the way we did it this way is, you know, it was supposed to be like laughing at people, but also like people are laughing back. They're not like scared of the performers and um yeah and then like the way they were handing out these uh pic like image like um these posters with the map actually of the exhibition um mm -hmm. and yeah maybe here we just like we can play some clips of the performance and we can stop whenever i guess mm -hmm. But like it was really interesting to see like people here like feeling so uncomfortable that the performers are like approaching them like very close you know and like people are not used to something like that maybe like just from observing like i know they want to shy out they want to hide but i feel like that was just you know the core of this like to make you feel like uncomfortable but also like try to immerse yourself within you know the performers the work and everything um i think even like for the for the performers there's 
it's tricky. You know, it's like if you're used to thinking stage and yeah. and you walk into an environment like that, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, adapting that uh, takes an expansive mind from everybody involved um, to, I, I mean, I don't think, I think, you know, all of us are very comfortable working that way and just traversing mediums without even noticing we've crossed a threshold but that's really it's it's not that easy for for other people to wrap their minds around it when when they become performers and so mm -hmm. there's this risk there's a sense of risk involved which is a very um you know kind of worthy risk to take yeah i think it ends here um yeah that was the last scene before they left you want to talk about the handbags for a minute? Ah, oh, okay, handbags. Okay, I love this. Um, um, so like I call these like mini installations or movable installations because like the way I think about every handbag is like an installation on its own because they're like there's so much effort that goes into like the making of each handbag. Um, it's, I want to go back to the, like the ones that I like. Yeah. So like I started just creating these concept handbag, just, you know, from findings uh, in antique stores or um, recasting an antique frame that I like found in, you know, whenever, like wherever and trying to create certain like details. And like, I think the way I like, yeah, the most exciting part about this is like the amount of people that works on one handbag, like it goes from like, a jeweler to a marble like person to like a caster and all of that and how that's all interconnected to like this one tiny piece but like um yeah and i and then i really wanted to expand onto this concept and try to collaborate with uh, with the artists like uh, sheikha and roba and even more eventually but um yeah so we wanted to create these exclusive handbags for the show and so we created one with the like um with a sketch from sheikha like using her door and then roda like reinterpreting the the carpet into this um it's actually a carpet uh, made in a uh, in Afghanistan that is then woven into like you know rewoven like the concrete is now rewoven into a carpet so yeah I'm just and hopefully they are gonna launch very soon so mm. stay tuned and they're only very 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 limited editions because they're just um, expensive and time-consuming to produce but yeah <laughs> you can get on the waiting list <laughs> pre-order <laughs> okay the last part of the exhibition, we are very aware that we are over time, but we will still continue. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, if you have been to the exhibition, there are books lying around everywhere and they seem like they're unrelated to each other. It's a different subject in each book. But in reality, each book has, has a hidden book inside the book. And that was basically the publication that we have created uh, for the exhibition in collaboration again with uh, Rashid Al Farasi, the, who graphic designed and also conceptualized how this book is going to be printed. So we got vintage books, uh, old books that we had in, in our homes, but also old books from all over the world. And then um, there was a library stamp with the name of the exhibition right on the book. And then from the inside, uh, of course, it has uh, writings, essays, um, an interview between the three of us and Ghaith Abdullah, uh, pictures, basically everything that was in the exhibition and also the curatorial statement. So these books are still available. They are also limited. And uh, you know, you could get your hands on one. Please let us know. Uh, contact us through our Instagram or through this chat or however long everybody's staying with us here. Um, but yeah, so that's basically it for Abu Dhabi Art. We do have one more part to talk, to talk about, but I'm also aware of time. Sarah, what do you want to do? I think we can get to a few questions, maybe around two or three, and then if we want to end it there and start the open conversation, we'll have around 30 minutes for that. Okay. Yeah. We have the Farasha part that we, Farasha you, Galler. Do you we can talk do We can do it? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah, do it. <laughs> but so yeah, but I'll go through it really quickly because we actually want to get on a conversation with everyone. So, but it's 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 a fun project. So we'll just go through it. So after Abu Dhabi Art, it was like, okay, where should we go next? And then a new warehouse appears. 
<laughs> suddenly out of nowhere a place where we can work uh, Rova uh, and I and Asha and so we arrived at this warehouse and it looked like this it had plenty of storage does not have ACs but also could be a place where we could start working together on a new project that due to COVID-19 has never been realized uh, right now has been postponed indefinitely but we didn't have the access to the gallery space where the project was going to be so we thought uh, working inside the space is going to be amazing, like setting up a prototype show or like putting together all of the things that we want to see, you know, in the same space just to get an idea of how it gets installed. So we started working from there. Roba did her rusting thing and I did my painting thing. And it was a few nice nights in the in the warehouse. It was very nice. Like it was, it was, it started to become its own like, and the Warhol factory is like the thing that we always talked about. We want a warehouse where we can work. Um, and we had this temporary place to start to work and collaborating became easier. So I created the stable, but Rova rusted it. And so now it's a collaborative piece between the two of us. Um, and then when we started putting it together, it actually started looking like a show. And we were like, we want people to come and see this just for the hell of it. And uh, the the best time to launch it was at, during the same time that uh, Warehouse 421 uh, showed that opened uh, right before COVID-19 has uh, brought misery upon all of us uh, on March 7th. Uh, it wasn't officially open, but yeah. Like yeah, it wasn't officially open. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was just, uh, it wasn't open. Okay, خلاص. I, I shouldn't say that, but anyways. We cropped this out when we posted on YouTube. Anyways, so during that day, we wanted, we really wanted to celebrate these two human angels and lovely beings, Munira Sayer, Hashil Lemki, who had a solo show in Warehouse 421. And so we decided to throw the after party in our warehouse. We sent these around on WhatsApp. Um, and we wanted people to come to just start to see the space and to see the potentials of the space or the potential of the art of gathering within the space. And so we installed again our lights overnight. We created a party. There was no lights. There was nothing. It wasn't actually livable for other humans other than us. But we got these lights from our, our, our lovely uh, light supplier who agreed to give us all of the themed lights from previous years. So like the year of tolerance and all of that. And so it was again about bringing the city into the into the space um, and it was all set up as dining tables uh, or sort of tables of convening and gathering. Um, and uh, this is basically the vibe of the space, but what happened within the space was interesting. Okay, so we surprised Hashid and Munira. They didn't even know that we, did, that we, did, we had all of the space and we created the cake out of their artwork. And for me, this is, this is also important, you know, like it, it seems like something that's not art, but that's basically what we are going for. It's the art of gathering. It's this event that allowed these people to have a safe space and to come and gather and something that's totally not institutionalized, totally on a whim. And it's where the magic happens. And this is where like people really let their guard down. It's not a clean up art show. Suddenly, out of nowhere, we had one of the visitors say poetry. Like, when does that happen? You know, out of nowhere in any gathering. And it was just a place where people were encouraged to participate to. I mean, I hope if you came to the party and you thought it was lame, please don't tell us. Um, we really enjoyed it. So and anyways, <laughs> this is a funny addition. But basically, we, we commissioned uh, Sagar Shehi, who is a famous uh, pseudo uh, poet. But you know, it's a form of poetry that we can appreciate. And so we created a poem dedicated uh, to Hashel and Munira. And we showed the screening of the poem. And it was uh, elicited a lot of uh, appreciation and laughs. It was fun. That's basically what I'm trying to say. And then Asha created like a birthday cake for me from a painting which again, I also consider all part of this event. Like, when will these things happen? And it's just this, this idea, يعني, this idea of the potential of where this could go. Again, you know, for future reference, for 
other art parties, for other places of gathering around art that are not uh, like technically, um, you know, art events, but they're not festivals either. There's not like food trucks and stuff. But again, you know, it's, it's this idea of like trying to gather people and have a safe space and have conversations around art that otherwise wouldn't happen in an exhibition space or in places like that. So that's basically it for Farasha Gallery. But uh, yeah, it was fun. That's my main point. <laughs> but we just wanted to add it because it's sort of where we're thinking of next, inshallah, uh, when COVID-19 leaves this earth. Uh, inshallah, we, we will go back. But uh, we're done, I guess. Any questions, anything, please like just tune in, show us your lovely faces or like let us hear your voices. Um, yeah, yeah, I would say that like the talk has officially ended, but as mentioned before, we're having an open discussion for anyone that wants to unmute. Um, I think it'd be better if uh, any of the questions that came through, if you would like to just ask them personally and that will get us going on a natural conversation. Um, so the mic is open for anyone that would like to comment or ask a question. Um, let me ask a question if I may. First, I want to say congratulations to these wonderful girls and yourself for tonight and this incredible body of work that they have done together. I'm looking forward to the next project. And can you tell us when or what it is so we have something to look forward to during these days of um, uh, hibernation uh, with COVID-19? All we say, uh, all we can say is that we don't even know. We don't. So, <laughs> like, we don't even know what's going to happen. So, But just to say there is something, like it's up in a space, but it's not yet you know, official and like, yeah, hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Great. Um, what else? Somebody? Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, I just wanted to say that there was a question from Nadine, um, Nadine K. Uh, which came through quite early in the session, if you would like to unmute um, and ask your question. Um, yeah, hi ladies, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, initially, actually I now have another question. <laughs> but so my first question was had to do with authorship because I know a lot of your works were quite intertwined. Um, so the boundaries were not really clear between where one person's um, imprint ended and other ones began. So I was just wondering how, I mean, I do see now that actually there's a lot of performative gestures that kind of, um, uh, they extend across all of your practices in the sense that I didn't know, for example, that Aisha, you were thinking about these very embodied, uh, very difficult kind of experiences underwater. And even though you're not actually expressing them through your own body, but you're actually trying to um, deal with that process. So I can see that all of you somehow are working with embodiment in a, in a, in a way. So I'm not sure that my first question um, is as relevant as I thought it was because I was trying to understand how do you let go? Like where is the point where as an artist you let go of your work and you not necessarily hand it over to someone else but where where does that combustion happen? Like, what was that process like for you guys? I mean, I know you were dealing with um, Ram and Rakmi and uh, Hissam, who it's very much also part of their practice, but I'm just wondering about what that was like for you ladies. Can I answer? Mm -hmm. No, I, like, go ahead, I'll add to it. <laughs> okay, um, I think, first of all, uh, it's, it is much easier to start to work as artists and collaborators when you start from the basis of understanding these people on a personal level. Mm -hmm. uh, forget that we are artists. We know a lot about each other and we know a lot about each other's struggles and how we got here and we know each, about each other's lives. We've, been, we've, been, we've known each other for a long time. So 
there's that basis of understanding at the beginning so that if there are any sort of the communication is clearer when you know the person uh, okay. and then another thing is is that it started to become clear that collaboration is the only way forward uh, mm -hmm. in the artwork uh, this idea of the singular artist doing everything on their own and uh, sort of becoming so you know self-centered or obsessed in a way where their work starts to cannibalize itself is becoming, uh, you know, for some people it works for them. But for a lot of people, extending your practice really teaches you a lot of you about your practice. Like mm -hmm. you cannot, you cannot uh, understand things unless you let go of all of these uh, preconceived notions about, no, this is my work or now how are we going to name this work? Everything is a collaboration, you know, like it, it doesn't, you know, you, you, it, it's just a threshold that you need to cross. And then after that, everything becomes super wondrous, you know, like, yeah. you know, maybe other artists, for example, let's say the, the example with the, with the painting um, interpreted as a cake. Other artists would be like, why are you putting my painting on a cake? You know, but for mm -hmm. me, it was like, I'm going to keep this cake forever. It's still in my freezer, you know, <laughs> you know okay. because it is now someone interpreted this and wanted to make a sculpture out of it. For me, it was a flat painting. Sure. So if there was no, if there wasn't this understanding to begin with, it wouldn't be the same. But before Aisha uh, and uh, Rauda, maybe if you want to respond, I think also what I hadn't realized before is the way you are all treating your relationship with the material or the non-living. And so I feel like the collaboration goes that far because, you know, where, for example, Rauda is looking at decay and uh, accelerating decay, where you are effacing part of the individual in your performance. Like you always talk about the protagonist, but there's no face, you know, mm -hmm. or where, you know, so where Aisha is also uh, looking at as well, also a very material based uh, process based practice. So I think that was something that was interesting to realize, even though I've, I'm familiar with all of your practices and I've been following it, I didn't really um, notice that relationship before which is in a way something that you know the art world at large is looking at in terms of the environment you know mm -hmm. and what happens to the things that we make so that element of decay is also quite interesting uh, to me and what you guys did uh, with this space as well yeah I just wanted to add like also like one part of us working together is having like a shared studio. So we used to work at the, like one of the studios at the Culture Foundation where we started to bring in all our stuff together and start to like see how things like react to each other. And I think that's where everything got like interwoven. And yeah, like from that point, like nothing was like you cannot separate um, the work from each other. And I think just that, you know, having like a shared studio to work from um, regularly to like have these ideas, um, you know, collapse or like emerge. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I have a question, if I may. Please. Hi, Moza. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the talk. It got me really revitalized and excited, and it's an amazing body of work. So, thank you all. And uh, I was wondering if any of your suppliers, manufacturers, or fabricators questioned some of the things that you asked them to do, especially those who are not used to working with artists. Any fun stories, any funny interactions? All the time, I would say, like Lil Abed. Um, I think I want to highlight one story specifically because it got me angry. Um, so this supplier who does my handbags um, originally is just a welder for like doors and other things. But like when I started to come in, like I was just discovering like different, um, like yeah, different metal workers in Masafah. But like I came across him because he had certain things that he can do. And then when I started to bring in like this idea of a handbag and how he can create this, you know, like small things and all of that. He then started to say to people that he now produce officially handbags and like, you know, keep like one sample of my work like next to him. And like whenever like a lady walks in, you're like, do you want to produce a handbag? I'm like, you never start with this. And like, you like he does with doors, you know, and it was so annoying for me because he like, like, I, I don't even trust like leaving things with him because you can always just copy it. But yeah. But you know, like, if you, if you, if Asha sends you a supplier, it's like, oh, I work with this guy, 
and you see his uh, images on Google Maps, more than once you will see her work in one of the images on Google Maps for his yeah. <laughs> for his factory or his whatever printing center. Diamond, العاشة ما شاء الله poster type. Hey, عادي. Uh, I have a question related to a um, similar topic, which is the like your collaboration, but also by extension, your collaboration with the suppliers um, and how you, um, I guess, view that relationship in, in the, you know, final, um, you know, installation that you had, say, like at Abu Dhabi Arts. Because um, I know in conversations with all of you um, that it's a huge part of your experiences in creating the work. Um, I mean, Asha, you were talking about like the WhatsApp uh, conversations, and I think those are those also become really uh, interesting sort of like artifacts of that process, and uh, definitely I think are worth. showing um and so i i'm also so I'm, i guess i'm curious about um how you are also um you know giving that stage maybe to these suppliers um yeah no we that have that, we definitely thought about that because it's not just i mean we do have suppliers but we also have artists that we work with so part of the publication that we're we're We're, like we worked on, um, but it's not part of the printed version, but where we actually asked all the suppliers to give us like a bio of like their work or who they are. And we wanted to realize all of them into like a form and like without putting anyone on top of anyone, but like just to have that, you know, like, like even appreciated like because they are, they are like, they are who made our work, you know, even possible. But yeah. Also, yeah, I mean, in a way, I think they, they're, I mean, you had performers in your uh, in your piece at uh, the Art, so in a way, they I think become play a very similar role. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, I had more questions, but you answered you answered many of them. So. Mm -hmm. I'm still waiting for my book. I'm still waiting for your art, my my art trade. I have so many things on my list. I'm still okay, waiting. I, the, I have. Two. <laughs> Coming soon. We'll okay, ship it. Come on. We don't have storage anyway. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Shamma. Hi, can you hear me? Because my laptop uh, speakers don't work very well. We can thank hear you. you. You can hear me? Okay, I have a question. Um, but first of all, thank you so much for this talk. It's so great to see so many familiar faces. And of course, our favorite three butterflies. Um, my question, <laughs> uh, my question has to do with, um, well, well, one of the things that grips me about your work is the, the translucence of it and the, uh, the various layers of blur. Um, and uh, we've already talked about the question of authorship, so maybe I'm going to go more into, uh, influences. Um, As steep as your work lies in in fantasy and in the surreal and in magic and myth, uh, as I interpret it, uh, to what extent do you think your work engages with the regular day-to-day -day realistic vernacular of the UAE, and how do you view that relationship, if if it exists at all? Sorry, can you repeat the last part of the question? Last part. yeah. Um, to so as steep as your work lies in myth and and, and yeah. the surreal, to what extent does it engage with the 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 realism and the day to day uh, vernacular of the UAE? Asha, I think you can. And is there a relationship between the two? Um, yeah, um, I mean, we talked about this bad earlier. Um, um, <laughs> Do you want yeah. me to talk with it? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I'll, I, okay, okay. Ohina, for example, a lot of people walk walked into the show and questioned why there were so many uh, chairs that looked like, yani, they came from a majlis. Mushu salfa. Yani, it's like, yani, it, it feels out of context, but it's actually very real. It is part of 
where we are living and this this the extraness and the extravagance of these things are they are around us yani uh, and we don't deny that yani there is no we don't have to deny it. but mm-hmm. to but there is a, a difference between like actually bringing it into part of the vocabulary as an artwork and once you take it out of that context and you bring it right into an art space and present it also as an art piece and alter it as an art piece it become it does, it achieves what you're saying it is rooted in reality okay and in, in the extravagance of the current times or like the, 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 this place in the world or where we're from but it's also it it now because of it entering sort of that art context through the intention of the artist becomes something that shwaya gets elevated you start to think okay what is this what is this a symbol of or uh, all of these additions to it how does that start to make it sort of less more guilty transparencies like it puts a layer over it that that transports it into that into something you, at least for me I- can I ask a quick follow up to that? Do you ascribe any functional value to the to the furniture that you have in terms of um, you know people being allowed to sit with uh, sit on the artworks and engage engage with them? I mean even though you're putting them in a way on a pedestal by as by uh, making them artworks in a in a in a gallery space or auditorium or whatever is there any um functional functionality that you um want to maintain? these objects yeah i think like for the for the chairs specifically like for the ones that we wanted to preserve like we would have like some sort of like you know stitching or 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 like an artwork that would hold it so like there draws a line that you are not supposed to like sit on this where others where we keep it open for people to feel free to sit on but i think like even for my work um because it's like heavy on textiles like i and like I always, like even part of my previous work, I always wanted to invite the viewer into the work and they immerse themselves like within the, within the artwork itself. So I never wanted to create this barrier where like you're not supposed to step on an artwork, but like even like that's part of the performance where we, we created this where people can feel free to walk on stage, sit on stage or move around freely and like, you know, touch whatever they want. But um, yeah, we did have... Um, I mean, nothing was stolen or broken, just to say. Uh, but we did we did worry about certain things, like you know, it might it might have happened. Um, but yeah, like we we draw a line, and like people would understand where to go to and not. Um, Thank you. I just want to add one thing. I think that we discussed earlier with uh, um, Rodan Sheikha, and just like you know how the um, normal viewer to, who enters like our exhibitions and the way they look at the work and like the way they want to interpret it. Um, I just want to give an example, like for my, like my sister who, um, I like, I like, I introduced her to the art um, and through my work and just for her like to come into this exhibition all she wanted to see is the furniture and the chairs and take pictures of that and like you know everything else was dismissed but like I love that you know like it just speaks to different people on different levels and yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. There was a question earlier on with Saeed and Madani, if you would like to unmute. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, congratulations. I really enjoyed the collaboration. Um, um, a lot of the compositions would be in the electric estate, as if one were viewing a somewhat scrambling intersection, where none really possess a centripetal characteristic. So your, eye, your eyes won't really rest uh, on something specific, but it would navigate the whole space and it would go from one thing to another. So, th- so really the question is, what were the challenges in expressing and establishing a sense of totality with the many compound works, performances and materials? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Saeed. Uh, can I answer that? Girls, Farasha. Um, this sense of anti-composition was very intentional okay the fact that yani, this totality was achieved through the actual artworks if we took the actual auditorium as a box and shook it up and like everything fell into a wrong into its wrong place yani, the show wouldn't look the same but there would still be a different dialogue so before we actually set were set on an exact uh, yani layout of the stuff 
we change places of things يعني close to 10 times probably يعني uh, everything was even if we were set today for example on day three of instar we were totally set on this is where this uh, this is where this part of the installation should be tomorrow we come back and through conversations with the curators we change it so i think even now يعني, looking at the pictures sometimes i think maybe we should have moved this and that i feel like that sense of totality is achieved يعني, not as us striving towards it um, there was a lot of things deleted within the process um, but there was a lot of things that made it يعني, the show was even more jam packed at some point uh, and i know that's very very hard to believe but <laughs> But um, yeah, I think يعني, I don't know if I answered your question. But um, I think everything is just يعني, there, there was intention in, in in mixing the performance and making it part of the audience and in involving the audience onto the stage. All of that. Um, We also again, okay go. <laughs> I'm just thinking out loud, but but يعني, again, a lot of this synergy, a lot of this uh, placement, a lot of this totality has been um, the curator's input. They are the most hands-on curators يعني, that you probably will ever meet. يعني, they are there 24-7 during install, all of the install days. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they, it's a continuous conversation between the six of us until we achieve what Uh, we're all happy with. So I think that sense of totality is also them. They've been doing uh, very similarly structured uh, shows for a long time. And so they know what's, what work speaks to what work. I mean, having been there for the process of, of the build, like sort of coming in and out on a daily basis, I would say that, you know, there, there was a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways that you can just put any object in any room that will, also direct the way people move through space and 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 they're acutely aware of that you know um so there's that's a big part of it you know it was it was when you when you put this here what does it mean um not only you know in terms of uh the objects in relation to each other but the the people in relation to objects how do i feel in the space i think that that it was a big part of what i what i observed anyway Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Shamil Amri. She asks, uh, she's curious to know how your work will continue to go outside the Rockne inspired curatorial brief. Will there, black, will there black box philosophy maintained through your practice or you see a different direction beyond the Abu Dhabi art show? Shamma, can you come on the mic? We want to talk to you. Can. <laughs> <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, because, because she did uh, a critique session about our work that we never got to hear about. So this is fun. If you want, Shama. If you don't want, it's okay. We'll just answer your question, sadly. <laughs> she personally texted me and said she's in quite a noisy space right now or else she <laughs> would. <laughs> okay, okay, no worries. And then, um, interesting, like very interesting question. Um, I think يعني, this I can't I can't basically cut out this experience and say whether or not it's going to influence me. It's these it's one of these things where that kind of philosophy will continue, I'm sure, in many different forms and it will continue to evolve. We're evolving as as a trio, but also as individual artists. They're evolving as individual artists. We really like the black box philosophy in terms of like breaking away from a white cube. Uh, also, after the Abu Dhabi art show within the theater, we were asked to put up a show again as part of the Abu Dhabi art, but within a white cube space. And it felt odd. It felt like, wait, we really need to rethink this. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I, like, I, it's more of a future-oriented question. And for now, our practices are separate because we are in separate studios, but we are thinking of different ways to continue. Uh, collaborating from afar um, but any any thoughts or ideas you want to add I think that 
Yeah, like the way we are like keeping this conversation going is just having like our weekly meetings, you know, just to catch up on like life things, but also like work things and like how we can talk about certain things that interest us. So I think that's like another way we keep our, our practice, um, you know, just growing onto something else. I will just say that uh, when you guys were actually speaking about the exhibition, there was a comment asking if you'd ever do anything virtually, collaboratively uh, with your artwork. So that's just something I want to put out there uh, from someone that's attending. I forgot who it was, sorry about that. Um, if anyone has any more comments or questions, please unmute yourself, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask a question of my own. Um, from our conversation uh, this past week and beyond, like this idea of unearthing keeps coming up and you've also used that word in the publication. So I'm wondering um, if you could just like elaborate on what that means to your individual practices or just like collaborat collaboratively. Uh, well, it's unearthing for some of us, but it's unseeing for others, <laughs> for Asha. Uh, I don't know, this, this, uh, this is a very interesting question, because I only use unearthing in the context of like, me having this romantic vision that one day in the, dis like, I, I can disappear from the art world for like 10 years, and one day in the distant future, someone would unearth my praxis. That's the only context I think about when I think about unearthing. Um, but again, yani, even in t I think it's just a general thing uh, in terms of uh, making art. It's just all about disintegrating all of the pieces and finding what's under it or like what's underneath it, but also physically unearthing, you know, the, the found objects that we find and Rola finds and Asha dives for. All of that is sort of excavating and you know, they're all, they're both very archaeological terms. And so that's how I relate it also to my practice. But um, yeah, interesting question. I'm going to think about that probably and text you later. <laughs> um, ladies, just one more thing. Um, talking about uh, terms, also the, the use of the term ritual was repeated a few times. I was wondering if you could each maybe unpack that term in terms of what it means in your practice is, is the ritual the gesture of performance or is it a social ritual is it um archaeological excavational let's say um anthropological i was wondering if you could say a, a few words on ritual okay it's all of that <laughs> <laughs> yeah all of the above but also Ritual comes sort of in the space and the place of or replacing uh, performance as a word. Mm -hmm. There is sort of a, a collective rejection of the word performance because performance feels um, first outdated in some in some format. Uh, it starts to mean something specific, uh, but also again, uh, it's devoid of a lot of things. It feels very contrived. It feels very calculated sometimes in terms of talking about what performance is. So ritual was sort of a replacement word that we started interchangeably using also with the trio, uh, the curators, uh, in place of that, because everything that we're doing is cyclical. So we don't, you know, Asha doesn't go to the sea once in a blue moon. She goes on a basis. And also that's the same for all of our practices, going and looking at these spaces where we excavate different found objects or excavate realizations of our own or however we want to put it, is all uh, cyclical, it's ritualistic, it's habitual. Like we do it because, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of carrying out a way of life. And so that's, يعني, it's, it's not separate from other rituals that we do during the day. So mm -hmm. that's the idea. And the, the word ritual actually just brings the practice closer to life as, as opposed to uh, يعني, pushing it away into performance and into art and into becoming يعني, I think again that's what we strive for يعني, as a collective is like where's that line between art and life everything is the same ف, ritual just helps to bring the word closer you know mm -hmm. I believe yeah beautifully said 